Thank you. Is it, is it time now? Yep. Okay, hi, I'm Lynn Dival of the Friends of Bad Fish Creek Watershed. Hey, my name is Ralph Erickson uh, from Stoughton. Uh, thank you for having us over today. And we also have with us Andy Horneman from Oregon, and he's also a member of the, of the Bad Fish Group. So we'll continue with the, uh, the talking about some of the projects that we've done as a group. Uh, the stream cleanup picture that you can see up there was actually on Butter Factory Creek, and that was with students. And then uh, we have the Bridge Sign Project, which uh, another member of our group, Jim Danke, got going. He said, how are people going to know where the bad fish is? We only have one or two signs, uh, and there are, I think there are a total of nine bridges crossing the little creek. And so he got that sign project going, and uh, he actually paid for a fair amount of it, too. Jim Danke, he lives at uh, just this side of Cooksville. Uh, then we also have, we have um, stream, a stream survey which we conducted where we went through the wildlife area looking at examples of bank erosion and uh, various other things that signal trouble for a creek. Um, the uh, middle sign is our invasive species activities and we've gone after a number of different invasive species, Japanese knotweed and uh, we, the garlic mustard and wild parsnip and others. So uh, in all these activities we send out a message and we ask for volunteers and it's just delightful how many people show up. When you ask people, to, when you ask Wisconsin people to volunteer, things get done. Another project that we work on, not shown, is a roadside cleanup. So there's a segment of yeah. Highway 138 that we work on. Yeah, that is. I think I have a slide on that one. But we got it. So uh, this was uh, a youth volunteer work day with the Stone High School. The uh, environmental studies <laughs> class came out, and if you want to get things done, you get high school students because they have so much strength and energy and good humor. And they did a lot of the work that, of uh, mulching the trail down to the creek, of pulling up uh, invasive honeysuckle. And you should see those high school boys go after invasive honeysuckle. They pull up right out of the ground, these great big shrubs. So those, those week, uh, work days are a lot of fun. Um, we also have adopted a portion of Highway 138 South. And uh, we do spring and fall cleanups for Yes. Can I ask a question? That's the landing that you said you have yes. adopted. Maybe I missed that part. Where is the landing? It's that old stage road, and it's part of the DNR land. It's the wild, uh, the wildlife area, the Bad Fish Creek Wildlife Area, and it's on the uh, just the southeast corner of the wildlife area. Yes. You didn't report what you found with water quality. Has it improved? Well, it's, it's uh, it sort of stays steady. It has not improved. And we haven't been able to do any projects that have uh, directly addressed water quality until currently. And a project that we're working on right now has to do with inputs like manure spills. And uh, so the water quality, had, it, during the years that I was doing the stream monitoring and, and the records that I've found, it's been a sort of steady state. It's, it's not awful and it's not good. It's, it's sort of halfway. And, and I could speak from my uh, working life at MMSD. Uh, if we look back at 50 or 60 years of water quality data uh, and how the treatment plan has changed, uh, we can point to some times when the water quality did change in the Baptist Creek for the better. Um, and pretty much in the mid 1980s, we were uh, the treatment plan was being upgraded significantly, and uh, and that was with money. It's called the, the clean water revolving fund monies to make treatment plants better. And so in the mid 80s, the treatment plan started to remove ammonia from the effluent, and ammonia was an inhibiting factor out in the stream. It's a bit of a nutrient, and it can impact uh, aquatic life. So when the ammonia levels came down. Uh, phosphorus levels were down also in the mid-80s, and the stream really changed. We saw that in our 
just in the amount of weeds growing in the stream, and then we saw it in the fish that we were ident identifying in, in twice yearly fish surveys. But you're saying that it's deep, the water quality is less good now than it was then? Um, from, let's just say, the 1970s to the 1990s, the water quality certainly got better. Uh, state, state permits to the treatment plant uh, forced certain things in the mid 90s. Uh, phosphorus had to be lower. So the treatment plant lowered the amount of phosphorus in the effluent, also improving water quality by, by doing that. And I believe there was a second time when the, low, the phosphorus levels dropped again. Yes, so, you're here in this. Yeah, in, in the last eight or nine years. Yes. Yeah. So water quality is improving, but not dramatically. And there, it's not, there's non-point sources and point sources. And, uh, Non-point sources are agriculture. So it's very difficult to pinpoint where a problem's coming from. There's also a fair amount of sediment in the, in the creek. Uh, and that's from agriculture, but it's also from the ditching of the, of the creek through the wildlife area. That was done to drain wetlands. And uh, what happens when, when that's done is that the dredge soil it's piled on the banks, and over the years that follow, then it gets washed back down into the creek. So dredging is an ongoing thing. And uh, the creek downstream of Cooksville is, or even a little bit upstream of Cooksville, is a natural uh, creek. It follows the, the meanders that a, that a creek wants to follow. But uh, upstream of the, in the wildlife area, it's pretty much a straight ditch. Uh, so it, the creek has a lot of challenges, and we love it anyway. <laughs> Come on. Good. Yeah, and so this was a fun project. This was creating this, uh, this poster, a watershed poster, kind of highlighting. There's a copy of it framed over there that Andy brought in uh, that uh, lets you Let's you take a look at some of the enjoyable features on the bad fish. There's also a picture of the bike, the bike rack at the uh, old stage canoe landing, uh, that lovely green bike rack, <laughs> and the picnic table with the poster in it. <clears throat> You're better at this than I am. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So those, these are just. This is just a list of, of groups that we've worked with and uh, places where we've. Uh, uh, gotten funding, and uh, we try to keep up these partnerships. Uh, I'm a member of the board of the River Alliance of Wisconsin, and uh, we have also worked with there are two Earths, you, you and, and Jim Post from M Madison Metropolitan Sewerage District have been integral members of the group. So we have, when we form these partnerships, we're able to get things done better. Yeah. All right, so some of you came uh, to find out about paddling and bad fish, and that's what we'd like to talk about. Uh, we have um, favored areas to paddle. We have not so favored areas to paddle, and we'll tell you about some of those. The, the not so favored is usually where the, the, it being a narrow stream, it's easy for a, a tree that loses its uh, its grip on the land to fall across the stream, and uh, for paddlers that, that can be a problem. Okay, so we are not the only ones who like to paddle the bad fish. Uh, paddlers come from all over southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois, and they paddle the bad fish year-round. Now, the reason for being able to paddle it year-round is the treatment plant, uh, yes. the effluent coming out on a January day is warmer than any of the lake water would be. The, the effluent might be in the 40s to some degree, whereas the lakes are at about 33 degrees. So uh, the stream is warmer in the winter because of all that flow from the treatment plant. When everything else is frozen, you go to the bad fish. But uh, <laughs> the prairie state canoeists, the bottom people on the list, come up, they schedule a trip every summer. For, uh, to come up to the bad fish just because they enjoy the stream so much. And then those natural meanders that I was talking about, the, 
the, the swings that the, that the stream does as it moves through the land. That's part of the appeal. It's, uh, there are little riffles, which are like low, low rapids, little gentle rapids. There are, there's wildlife. Uh, you'll see sandhill cranes, you'll see bald eagles, you'll see all kinds of, uh, of songbirds and apparently beavers, though I've, beavers, I've beavers. never seen any beavers. I've seen otters and uh, people catch fish. So it's a, uh, there are wildflowers along a number of the banks downstream of Cooksville. It's a very pretty place to paddle and on a summer day you, you can't find a better one. Uh, Milespaddle.com uh, is, a, is a website that if you are a canoeist or a kayaker, you should visit because that will give you information on not just on the bad fish, but on really great uh, places to paddle around Wisconsin. The Mav City Paddlers is a group that, that takes a trip a couple times a year on the bad fish and also the, the Sierra Club. So we have, we have lots of friends in the paddling community and uh, they like it just as much as we do. Any comments, Andy, on paddling? No, it's fun. Oh, Andy's avid. Oops. Yeah, so, oh, back, the so back bad. one, yeah. Yes. So, Andy created an online map, and if you uh, go on there, you can click on any one of those green things, and it'll tell you about a, a place where you can put your canoe or kayak in. It'll tell you what to expect there. There'll be some photographs, and uh, it'll tell you the distance to the, to the next point where you can either take your canoe out. Um, uh, it'll give you give you the information you need to know. Uh, so his paddling guide, and if you would want to click the next one, can be reached at either of those locations. You can either go on to tinyurl.com slash badfishmap or milespaddle.com and then go to the badfish section and then they have, a, they have a big section on the badfish. And so you get all the information you need to know about, about a, a trip on the badfish there. Oh, come on, I did not hit it that many times. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, this is the next slide. Yeah, this is the next one. So safe paddling on the bad fish. Uh, how many canoers and kayakers do we have? Okay. How many of you have done a lot of creek paddling? And, and you've done some. How many want to paddle that are not paddlers yet? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, you know, a, many people who have paddled on a lake are, are kind of surprised when they paddle a creek for the first time because it, it does unexpected things. And that's, uh, this is a good creek to learn on if you go out with somebody who knows what they're doing uh, because it's not, it's not a violent creek as long as you stick to a good water level. Uh, you should obviously always wear a life jacket. I say this, I was talking to the people at the table where I was sitting about, we had all of us, uh, had experiences with talking with teenage people about why you wear a life jacket. And yes, you do have to wear a life jacket. I have four kids and I spent most of their teen years telling them that they had to do something safe when they didn't want to. But there, there have been drownings on the Ahara and there was one this past summer. And so a life jacket at least gives you a fighting chance. And not paddling alone is another good Bit of advice. I noticed you in the picture that you're wearing helmets. Too. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the the helmets is a little unusual for that picture. We don't you don't normally see helmets out there. It's not it's not class two or three. No, no. no but these were these were this was a group that was learning. And they were learning. Yeah, water. they were. Yeah, it was a, a learning group, and they were being led by a, a guide who uh, insisted that they they have their uh, their helmets on. I have a question about shuttling. Yes. Susie and I go to the launch. Speak up, speak up. Uh, I assume Susie and I go to the launch place with our kayaks. Or, and we take the car down to the pickup point. How do we get back so we can have 
questions about how to make shuttles. And, uh, yeah. It could be quite an art form. Um, <laughs> there's, di there's different strategies. Uh, some involve bicycles. Mm -hmm. Some involve more than one vehicle. If you go with a group, it makes it easier. So then you leave the canoes at the, at the put-in point, and you take the vehicles all, you, you take most of the vehicles down to the, down to the other end, and then you drive back in one vehicle, and uh, then you put in, and then you drive, so then you're paddling down to your vehicles. The other way is, another way is to lock a bicycle at the end, uh, lock it to a tree, and then there's a bicycle waiting for you when you get out. You do probably want to have somebody to watch the canoe or kayak while you pad, pedal back up to your your car. Uh, Some have used their thumb. Have you yes. ever done that? Did you hike back? <laughs> There's that. <laughs> yeah, there, you, you get creative when you... <laughs> uh, I have a story about that. My husband and I did a lot of paddling in Minnesota to write guidebooks for, for canoeing and kayaking in Minnesota. And my mother, who at the time was in her late 80s, uh, called me one day on the cell phone and as it happened, I was in a place where I could get her cell phone uh, call. And she said, she said, I woke up last night and I just thought to myself, okay, when you paddle downstream, how do you get back to your car? <laughs> I said, Mom, we're okay. <laughs> she was worried about it. She was trying to visualize it. And she had always paddled on lights. Anyway. So that's a sidetrack. So if it's one couple in one canoe, possibly, it may mean two cars, unfortunately, or, yeah. or bicycling. There's one more. You can take the, one of the wheels off your bicycle if you have a canoe that's big enough, put the bicycle in the canoe, and paddle downstream with that. And my husband and I have done that many times. <laughs> and then you have the bike. And then I always stay with the canoe, and he always does the riding. You have the bike to get back to the car. So it is sort of a, a, a puzzle. There you have it. <laughs> it was a Norwegian question. That was what, that's what Dwayne said. OK. OK, this is safe levels for paddling on the bad fish. If you stick between 110 and 190 cubic feet per second, then you're going to be safe. Now, that probably doesn't mean much to most of you. Cubic feet per second is a measure of how much water is heading downstream at any given moment. And uh, you can find that number for the bad fish, an up, up to the minute number, by Googling USGS that's United States Geological Survey, and bad fish. And just like that, you'll have a chart that shows you what kind of flow is on the bad fish at that moment. You do not want to paddle the bad fish in high water. There are things that you'll run into. And there is a farm bridge downstream of Cooksville that you can just barely get under when the water's high. So um, anyway. That's another part of the safety, and that's, you can see how much it varies just by that little sample. That's one, two, three, four, five, six days of, of uh, measurements, and it spiked at one point up to, um, I think, I can't read the number from here, but... It was possibly one of the worst days ever, last August, yeah. and it spiked over 1,500, if I recall, yeah. and normal flow was about 150. Hey, yes, Ann. Just, I mean, just to say how how much this changes after the four inches of rain we had early last week, it was over a thousand, and then by the weekend it was back down to two fifty. Yeah. So I mean, it, it goes up fast, but it comes down yes. fast. And you know, something else to say would be, it's as, as you're walking or as you're paddling, it's not so much how high the water is; it's just how pushy it is. So if you're in a group of just people walking somewhere, you can kind of get herded different places, the water would just push you into things that you don't want to be in. That, that's where most of the danger comes in. That's a great explanation. Yeah, the, the, uh, the water, as you said, gets a lot pushier the higher it gets. It's tremendous energy in that water. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs>
Okay, so now it's just going to be a series of people pictures of, of different uh, trips that, that uh, various members of the group have led on the batfish. Uh, we have, in recent years, we've done one with the Natural Resources Foundation of, of Wisconsin. It's one, and one of their published tours out of their uh, annual tour book. Yeah, and uh, Ralph and Andy and uh, I think Jim Post also led the, the one this year. Clicking. It's a little delayed. How about I just click it for you here? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Andy also uh, led a trip uh, with Oregon uh, Community Education. And we've had trips that are just, just our group inviting anybody who wants to come along. And in, in these cases, what happens is that um, we'll do the trip and then we'll have a picnic in Cooksville afterwards. The common boats that you'll see out there, <coughs> kind of what Andy has on display out in here in the hallway, is uh, 12, you know, 10, 12, 14 foot kayaks are Stop good. Um, a 17 foot canoe can be handled. You know, Lynn and her husband are experts. They can, they can manage a, a long canoe. Yeah. If, uh, if you know about canoes, you'll know that there are canoes that are better on lakes, and those have a pretty much of a flat bottom, and there are canoes that are better on, on rivers and streams, and they have what's called some rocker to them, and that allows you to turn the boat quickly and uh, avoid obstacles, like big boulders in the middle of the stream. So. Uh, if you have a canoe with some rocker to it, then that's a good one to take on a stream. Now, I mentioned before that paddlers paddle the creek year-round, and this is a winter group. You can see the snow. <laughs> and they, um, <laughs> there's, there's a group who goes out every January 1st, and it, the, the stream's always open. Uh, there's a, a big paddle event up in Madison called Canoe Copia every, every uh, spring this, uh, in, in March. Mm -hmm. And there's a group of people from there who go out for, uh, you know, sort of kick off the season by going out right after Canoe Copia. But it's, it's, it sees a lot of paddling traffic. Uh, I remember the, the two years ago, it froze up to the Riley Road Bridge, uh, which is downstream of Cooksville. But it didn't get any higher than that. And that was during that, one of those polar vortex events. Uh, it, was, it was cold for a long period of time, and very cold. But generally, it, it will, I've never seen, ever seen it freeze all the way up the stream. Okay, so some of the challenges that the creek faces have to do with the water quality. And well, we've been working with the, uh, the Rock County Department of Health, Environmental Health, uh, recently, and um, their testing found that E. coli, or coliform bacteria, in the creek have risen in, in the last, just in the last few years, above the level that's acceptable for recreational waters. And bad fish is considered a recreational water. It's, it's a, a paddleable stream, and that's in, in Wisconsin. Anything that's a paddleable stream is a recreational water. So with this rather consistent rise in E. coli above what's considered safe levels, we decided that we wanted to try to find out more, and we'd like to try to, to help the creek by putting pressure on various uh, policy makers. Um, as one of our group members said, our friends paddle that water, and they want to know it's safe. Oh, there we go, okay. So, that is an E. coli. But it's five million times as big as a real E. coli. <laughs> it's hanging in an art museum in Sheffield, England. But just, I mean, it just kind of gives you a sense of what, 
what you would be running into if you were, even though they're tiny, they're nasty. The thing about E. coli is it's a bacteria that's present in the guts of warm blooded creatures, so it, it's a great indicator of potential other disease causing organisms. It's not, E. coli is not necessarily a disease causing, but it, it can be an indicator of other pathogens. And so, as it comes from the guts of warm creatures, uh, it, it can give us some clues that we're going to talk about here. Uh, yeah, well, we have um, uh, manure falling into the creek uh, as a possibility. We have uh, the fact that, um, uh, that MMSD is not required by law to disinfect the water that flows into the creek after between October 15th and April 15th. So during the winter, the, the Wisconsin state law says they do not have to. Their permit uh, to discharge effluent does not have to involve disinfecting the, the effluent. Now, that doesn't mean it's not treated. There, that's a, that's a, a, a final step, the disinfection. And Dis Ralph can talk about that. Sure, disinfection is usually the last step at any treatment plant, you know, after many different other processes to remove pollutants from, pollutants from the water. Uh, disinfection for MMSD involves ultraviolet light. Um, many other treatment plants still use a somewhat older technology of bleach, if you will, chlorine, to, to kill organisms in the water. Chlorine can have its own problems when it gets out to the environment. It can kill good organisms out in the stream. So MMSD is used uh, ultraviolet light since the 1980s. Um, the permit is very specific on what kinds of levels of bacteria, coliform bacteria, have to be met. And it's usually a summer and a winter thing. The summer is a much lower value that, that can be allowed in the water uh, because that's, that's the time of year when the DNR thinks that people are out in the stream. The winter number is typically higher such that uh, the treatment plants, most treatment plants don't run any disinfection in the winter time. You could, oh, yes. The thinking is twofold, that there's not a human activity going on where people are swimming, playing in the stream, and also the, the, the viability of the bacteria, uh, of the pathogens is greatly reduced in cold weather. You know, they like a warm uh, host. You know, the, moving from person to person is, is kind of the, the thing that you know, bacteria or pathogens really rely on. So, the cold weather has a negative impact on, on pathogens. Uh, so, a couple. Is that ultraviolet treatment that expensive? But that's a question uh, to be asked, I think. It might be more policy questions to ask in the future. Is how, how much does that really cost to disinfect in the winter time? You know, I, I know MMSD uses the winter to do maintenance. It's a complicated system, lots of light bulbs, thousands of them, and wiring, and so winter is a maintenance period to, to make sure the UV system is working well. But it, there's questions that could be asked in, in policy policy makers about wintertime disinfection. The MMSD permit, uh, which is renewed by the state, uh, came up for renewal this past fall. And the, re the, the new permit still hasn't been issued. And they had a comment period last October. And our organization commented and we urged making that window of non-disinfection much smaller, you know, as small as possible, based on the evidence from these from these tests. If you look at the at the chart up here, that's four hundred. And that's the level at which the state says recreational waters should not the should not have an excess of E. coli. Uh, over the 400 mark. And then this is bad fish. So it was up over 1,000 in the winter, but it was also over the 400 in the summer. So MMSD obviously is not the only source of E. coli because there, there's agriculture all along the creek. And our, our project that we're trying to get going um, is to determine what percentage is, is from what source. And the, uh, that's, you, you can see the winter sampling, how the bad fish really 
towers over the other uh, waters in the region, the Ahara, Springbrook. Rock River, in, you know, if you look at the Rock River, you'd think it was much more polluted than the bedfish, but uh, the, the levels are, are higher in the bedfish by a huge margin. The Sugar River is another one on there. Okay, so these, these are the, the rules. Raw wastewater are, is allowed 10 million uh, coliform, uh, what are those? Is it coliform units? Um, colony forming colony units. Colony forming units. Okay, I got it right. Colony forming units of fecal bacteria per 100. Treated, 10,000. Disinfected wastewater, which is what's coming from MMSD, up to 400. Uh, can you click it again, please? And, and this, is the, this is the state law, Natural Resources 210.06, Sewage Treatment Disinfection. Disinfection is often not required by the state October through April. And that is, so that's the law. Uh, the law does not apply to manure being dumped next to the stream and then being flushed into it by uh, a spring thaw. Okay, so what we'd like to do as a group, this kind of sampling is, is something that the, that the counties and the state do not do for streams in general. They, they're done uh, on an ad hoc basis. We want to sample it to see whether the source is primarily human from effluent or animal from agricultural runoff. We want the samples would be analyzed at the State Lab of Hygiene and we'd use the results to encourage policy changes. Now, what are the possible policy changes? If it turns out that it's primarily animal contamination, is to encourage uh, the legislature, which is redoing things in the DNR uh, on a fairly regular basis, to increase their budget for conservation wardens, because those are the boots on the ground. Those are the people who go around and say, okay, no, you can't put your manure pile here. Your permit only allows you to put it there. Or, you know, other changes that would include not issuing as many permits for uh, moving manure. The bad fish is the proud recipient of manure from Lake Mills, where there are a couple of chicken CAFOs, and they truck the the manure over and they put it near the banks of the bad fish and this is done with DNR permit and then when a spring thaw comes along as it did in March of this year the uh, waters from the thaw carry the manure down into the creek and that's that's something that shouldn't happen but it did can I add a little bit about Absolutely. the type of testing? Uh, treatment plants for decades have done coliform testing, but that testing usually didn't, did not tell us what the source of coliform was. Was it humans? Was it uh, uh, agriculture type animals, you know, cows or pigs? Was it wildlife like ducks and geese? Um, the new testing that's available is DNA based. And so it's, it's got a price tag that's coming down, So, but it's the kind of testing that's not normally done by a treatment plant. Uh, the city, uh, the Milwaukee area has pioneered some of this work, and they were able to find that the beach closures weren't necessarily from the wastewater treatment plant, they were from wildlife on the beaches, ducks, gulls, geese. Uh, so that's what the DNA, DNA testing can uh, help us with. So it's so something new that we're, we're trying to organize a project here locally. As, as you note on the, on the uh, slide, uh, there are, uh, the, the testing that's available is something that we could do uh, in conjunction with the Rock River people, uh, uh, or the Rock County people. The, they would do the testing downstream of us and we'd do the testing in our area. And uh, this would give us a start on understanding where to direct our, our uh, our efforts to put pressure on people to change policy. Uh, the total cost of the lab analysis is 2,250, and uh, 
is is this this slide kind of says it all. We are a small, all all volunteer organization, totally dependent on outside funding. County budgets do not allocate the funds for this level of water quality testing, and your gifts will help us help the bad fish. Come on back in that slide up just one. Sure. This one? No. Forward one? Yeah, one before. Oh. Too much clicking. You got did you get it? I guess I okay. Uh, you could consider a financial gift to our E. coli project. You can join the friends. Or you could just like us on Facebook. And we, uh, we have a pretty active Facebook page where we share what's going on in the creek. Uh, people will message us and ask for advice on whether it's safe to paddle on a given day. And, uh, it's a, and there are a lot of good photographs posted. It's a good place for you to find out more about the creek if you're interested. You can also tell your friends about the creek and what its needs are. It's a small creek, as I've said before, but it's beloved by many. And we'd like it to be, continue to be a good paddling resource for the area. We'd also like it to just be clean water, which I think this year in Wisconsin is the, the year of clean water. And we'd like to do our part to make that happen. I'd like to thank you all for, for listening. And if you have any more questions, please We'll do our best with any questions you might have. Also, to mention how can you help, our mission of the month here at Peoples is, as, I, as we've said, the Friends of Bad Fish Creek. So if, if you're giving to the mission of the month, that's where it's going to. Any questions? I'll bring the microphone around. You were very thorough. Yeah. <laughs> you answered questions we didn't even know we had. <laughs> I have a question. When do you ex when would you do the water testing? Does that happen in the summer? Does it happen in the spring? <coughs> okay, so we're coming up on the fifteenth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're coming up on the fifteenth of October, and the disinfection stops. Uh, on the 15th of October. So we would, we would probably start soon after that. But we, uh, until we have the, the funding, we, we don't know when we can start because we have to take the samples in the same day we, we take them. We do the sampling. So, yes? Are the farmers given any guidelines as far as where they dump them in there? Yes, they, their permits specify exactly where they can dump. And uh, this uh, manure that's, that was dumped on the land on, along 138 was not dumped in the right place. But they went ahead and dumped it anyway. The weather was difficult, and they should have just turned around and taken it back to the chicken farm. But instead, they dumped it in the, in the wrong place, and it, they dumped it in what's called a concentrated flow area, which concentrated its flow to the bag fish. And so it sat there, it was done in the fall, and then it sat there all winter, and then as soon as the melt started, in it went. And uh, the conservation warden is, is just too busy and did not check on that, that particular permit enough. And the, the end result was that, you know, the conservation warden who, who's assigned to that area cares very much about the creek. He, he kayaks on it. They, uh, they gave, the, the, there was an enforcement meeting in July, and they withheld the permit until they're able to prove that they can do better, but they did not find them. No, the teeth. I found interesting about this chicken manure it was uh, it, it kind of, there's a two part uh, going on here. The, the producer, the egg, the egg producer, if you will, that is holding the permit. They're generating manure, but then they may go and contract 
haulers to take that away from them. It always keeps building up, right? You have to, and so it seems to be a breakdown is how is the contract hauler helping to make sure that the permit conditions are being met. The permit is held, if I recall, by the, the producer. Yeah, it, he, Ralph is absolutely right. The permit's held by the by the, the guy who owns the CAFO, the chicken CAFO. And then they've got the hauler, and then you have the receiving end, which is the farm on 138, who has agreed to, or where the owner has agreed to receive the manure. But receiving the manure is uh, uh, is just, it's just a matter of agreeing, because it's not his responsibility to be sure that it's put in the right spot. And so he can't be held responsible for when it's put in the wrong spot. But if enough attention is paid to these, uh, enough attention is paid to these permits and the process, then there, things could be improved. Now Black Earth Creek out uh, west of Madison is, uh, has had uh, fish kills that have resu uh, resulted from manure flowing into that creek. And there's been a tremendous amount of pressure put on the people who live along it and the farmers and uh, the conservation wardens to watch over it because it's a very highly prized trout fishing creek. And bad fish isn't, isn't the, on the same, you know, plane as, uh, the, as Black Earth Creek, but it's our creek and we want to take care of it. Any other questions? Thank you for yeah. well, having us. Uh, thank our guests.